Hello and welcome everyone and uh, thank you all for joining us. We have an exciting panel lined up for you here today and uh, a great set of panelists with whom I'm, uh, I'm eagerly looking forward to have uh, an interesting conversation. So uh, the way we are going to do this panel is that uh, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, what the panel is going to be charged with and then I'm going to hand it over to the panelists for their vision talks. Following that, we're going to have um, uh, an exchange uh, of, of uh, Q&A. So let me share my screen and, and let's get started so that at least you get to see who the panelists are today. Uh, so I'm very pleased to have and really honored to have uh, a, a number of uh, uh, experts from industry, from uh, nonprofits, from the federal government, and also from academia. And really, I think this is that collaborative environment that is needed to solve this very pressing and tricky problem of Will 6G be ready for native AI and machine learning? And this is clearly a hot topic today. I mean, there's hardly a conference where you don't see uh, tens or perhaps even uh, dozens or hundreds of papers on just this topic. And yet we are still far away. So the goal of this panel is to really demystify uh, the gaps, identify barriers, and collaboratively figure out what do we need to get there. So, uh, so just to frame, this, this panel, I just have a few slides that are going to point out some key questions and key pointers that the panel is being charged to, to really address and answer. So the first one is, um, you know, we, we do speak a lot about machine learning in 5G and, and there's already a considerable amount of effort that uh, has begun in incorporating machine learning into 5G. Now, are we, ready for 5G before we even go to 6G? Are we there yet already for 5G so that we can take the next big jump? And when we go to that next big jump for 6G, uh, what would be the extreme performance metrics uh, and what sort of applications would emerge for which there is no way out? We have to do, we have to get a, a, a robust machine learning pipeline into the architecture design. So what would be those metrics and problems? And finally, um, is there a grand vision, a grand uh, a moon landing scenario that the panel could perhaps charge the audience with and say, you know, can you, can you get this? Can you, can you land this flag on the moon? And if you can identify a couple of these use cases, that would be wonderful. Now, when we talk about 6G standard and uh, what does it mean to be ML ready, uh, there's clearly questions on where should the computation happen? There are questions on, uh, let's say you have intelligence in the devices and, and how do you even certify those devices? How, and these devices are going to learn and adapt and how will you benchmark them against a common frame of reference? Um, there are other challenges of privacy and security concerns that will be brought up multiple times by the panel. And, 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 and along with that, you know, as wireless engineers, we love, deterministic performance, we love guarantees, we learn safe, we, we, we love the safeguards, how much of it is feasible? And in absence of it, can we still get uh, meaningful uh, utility out of the network, even if it can't give you absolute guarantees? So when we talk about uh, machine learning and we can't divorce the network from the machine learning itself. So at one hand, machine learning is aiding the network, on the other hand, the network must provide resources for the machine learning to operate. And so the panel is going to bring this up. Uh, and, and this is a really catchy title. Is it ML for networks or networks for ML? And the, the panel will have some very interesting insights on what is needed and how do we bridge that gap? How can the network support complex and, and really meaningful real-time machine learning? And uh, a couple of uh, thoughts from just our recent experiences. So I am. Uh, uh, I'm glad to be a, a participant for, of the uh, NSF-funded uh, AI Edge Institute that was just announced. It's led by Ohio State. Uh, and so we did a survey among the PIs who are participating in that institute. And the question was that, uh, what is it that is stopping you from doing uh, great machine learning in context of data sets and availability? And so the two pointers that stand out here 
are A, that there's a considerable learning curve towards using testbed platforms and facilities from which data sets could be acquired. And the second one is even if you have data sets, there is, it is lacking documentation, it is lacking uh, ways to interpret it meaningfully. So there's clearly a, a journey that we need to traverse here. And, and to get there in say five plus years, we need tools, we need incentives to generate good data sets and to basically even understand what is good data. So the panelists here are really going to talk about data sets and the challenges and the availability and, and, and what do we need to do to bridge that gap. And finally, I, I, I want to bring this up uh, that we are taking concrete steps towards uh, addressing some of these problems at, at the grassroots level. So uh, personally, I am uh, I'm the PI of a recently awarded community infrastructure uh, project from NSF on, on, on data set generation, sharing and maintenance tools. So our goal here is really to design tools from which uh, users who are not say uh, greatly experienced in the nitty gritties of a testbed operation should still be able to go fetch relevant data and they should be pre-processing tools that are able to clean and filter out data so that they can make it, uh, uh, they can make it adapted for their own research. And, and this is only possible if we have the support of, of course, the federal government, and we're very grateful to the National Science Foundation, but also with the support of other companies. And we are in fact working with NVIDIA, National Instruments, et cetera, to, to work together to create uh, this, this, uh, this data set generation sharing tools. And I think this could be a way to democratize data sets across the board. So uh, enough of me talking, you have not come here to hear me talk, uh, you have come here for the panelists. And, and um, I just want to stop my share here. And uh, uh, while uh, uh, Alex brings up the, the slides, I'm, I, I would love to uh, introduce to you our first speaker for today. We, uh, we are very honored to have uh, uh, Nagin Himayat, who's principal engineer from Intel. And, uh, and she really conducts research on next generation 5G and beyond uh, systems for mobile broadband uh, uh, architectures. She has a number of different publications and, and greatly involved in, uh, in the design and, and contributing in standardization efforts, et cetera. So Nagin, uh, over to you. Thank you. Can people hear me well? Just checking. Yes. Okay, so I guess the discussion point will be, uh, you know, will 6G be ready for native AI and machine learning? Uh, but that's the discussion we'll have. But just to kick off the discussion, I would go to the third slide, uh, where, slide number three. Uh, so we do believe that uh, even though maybe it's not native, but six AI and machine learning will be integral to 6G networks. And there are three different aspects that I wanted to highlight, which people are familiar with because Kaushik touched on them. Uh, so one is AI ML for designing of 6G network all the way from physical layer to end-to-end -end, you know, communications. The second is that uh, 6G networks, uh, the devices that uh, comprise these networks would be able to uh, support AI computations more pervasively as we go further. And then third, as uh, more and more uh, safety critical applications such as autonomous services get deployed on uh, 6G networks, then AI would have an important role to, uh, towards co-designing some of these networks with these autonomous services to, to sort of better meet the quality of service of these services. So next slide. Uh, so I'll start with the first uh, little bit of uh, you know, background on. Uh, so as we see that the scope of AI and machine learning applications in design of 60 systems continue to be you know, uh, getting broader and broader. I mean, there are more application areas that we get uh, that are identified and the, uh, uh, the publications continue to show promising results in here. So the first one is basically, uh, this is work done by my colleagues at Intel, where they've applied uh, AI machine learning for uh, channel estimation by just kind of looking at one symbol and uh, using the pilots to uh, develop challenge, channel estimates and the performance is pretty good and robust with low complexity neural networks. The second, I think our next uh, panelist would talk about it, which is basically they're proposing uh, AI to be sort of native to the air interface and basic uh, an air interface which is based on AI. So I think I'll let um, uh, Jacob talk about that. Uh, also, radio resource management has been a big problem in uh, is uh, continues to be more complex as we go along because of the uh, the variety of resources that you need to manage, including massive MIMO resources, interference, and so forth control and so forth. And here also uh, some of the work done by uh, my colleagues 
show that multi-agent reinforcement learning techniques uh, actually are very promising in uh, they show results which uh, says that we can have a better trade-off in terms of sum rate throughput versus cell edge throughput even when using decentralized approaches and come close to very centralized approaches. And then finally, I think most communication systems currently are defined by you know, reliability transmitting bits. And now the discussion is, can we reliably convey the semantics associated with these bits? And there is some recent work which actually show promise in that regard. So it's just like a growing field. Uh, next slide, please. Mm. And also we note that there is a lot of momentum for supporting AI compute over wireless networks and people are familiar with federated learning, which allows uh, end devices which collect the data to collaboratively learn AI models uh, while keeping the data private. So there's a lot of appeal in that particular approach. Uh, but to scale this type of uh, you know, met method, we really need uh, to address a lot of challenges which have also been identified. And some of the work that we are doing are trying to address some of these uh, uh, challenges of, you know, how do we efficiently use AI resources, which not only uh, include compute and communication resources, but also data resources through better sampling techniques. We are also looking at coding techniques to improve uh, redundant computations to improve the reliability of computations because the wireless edge environment tends to be very dynamic and unreliable. Uh, other work by uh, partners are sort of focusing on what are the computational architectures that are well suited for the resource constraint uh, of the devices that occur on wireless networks. So you want to learn smaller models on end devices and larger models on more capable devices. And then you need to uh, find a way to compose them together such that you have a more powerful model overall. Uh, finally, there is room to optimize wireless networks specifically for AI workloads. And going further, can you use wireless uh, medium itself for doing computations and over the air combining and so forth. And there are some interesting results reported in this paper. Uh, so uh, the next slide, finally, I, uh, uh, I will not go into too much detail, but uh, as we uh, say that when we uh, introduce very stringent safety critical services over uh, unreliable wireless networks, the, uh, the requirements of reliability, latency and so forth are just go through, you know, become even more stringent. So you need nine, nine reliability and so forth. Uh, and some of the work that we've done with University of Pennsylvania sort of challenges that. So the idea is if you can co-design, you can use AI to co-design your network resource allocation, which is more aware of the control states of what you're trying to control, then you can really relax the reliability requirement. And I think that's a very sort of uh, important area to focus on because you, it's very difficult to meet some of these requirements otherwise. So finally, uh, uh, next slide. So there are lots of, uh, I think there's one more slide that we can back up. Uh, one more slide after this. Yes, thank you. So, uh, I mean, all this work basically show a lot of promise for using AI in 60 system. There are lots of opportunities. Of course, work needs to be done as is pointed out by Pashik as well. Uh, there needs to be standards which allow, you know, some of the information to flow and that work has already been started in ORAN. Uh, I mentioned uh, data was mentioned as one of the main challenges to improve your AI models and some of the work on federated learning or privacy preserving federated learning can help in that regard. AI can be used for generating synthetic data sets. So there is an important role uh, for AI to play there. And then the co-design thing that I just talked about to relax the requirements on 6G networks. Of course, there are lots of challenges, which I think the panel will talk about. Robustness and security continues to be a challenge, especially for mission critical networks. Uh, the role of uh, self-learning approaches and self-validating approaches so that, you know, you can minimize the human in the loop uh, in the system. And then I think uh, people realize that just analyzing the performance of a single AI loop is, is hard enough. So if you have multiple of these working together, uh, we really don't have a handle on that. So that, that would be a big challenge to address. And we are partnering with NSF, as Pashik also mentioned, on some of these programs, such as Resilient Intelligent Networking, Cisnet Generation Systems, the MLWINS program, and we expect to address some of these challenges going forward. So with that, I hand it off back to Pashik. Uh, Thank you, Nagin. And, and while this next speaker gets ready, I just want to pose, throw one question at you. Uh, it, just, it comes up in the chat here. So the question is, um, you know, you mentioned code design. I'd love if you can reinforce that concept a little bit because a, either you do a real code design or you just use AI ML to, uh, to enhance the operation of a given network. So I give you the network versus a code design network. So can you shed a little bit of light on that? So yeah, I think uh, the work that was shown here, which we didn't get a chance to actually go in detail is 
while, while I'm actually allocating my resources, I don't need to allocate resources to control a loop which is already very stable, a control state, a control system which is already very stable. I can relax those requirements and steer away my resources to some other, you know. And likewise, if my control system is also aware of the network conditions, then I can probably take some mitigation action to do this. And if you do that, then you can show that I don't need like, you know, 99% packet delivery ratio. I can probably get away with 70% packet delivery ratio. The role of AI here is interesting because you can learn the control behavior of the system you're trying to control and you don't need to know it a priori. So that's how you can actually generalize this approach to many, many systems. Uh, I think that's, that's the idea behind it. Got it, got it. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for your insightful comment. Um, we'll move on to our, our next panelist for today, uh, Jacob Hoydis. Uh, so, so Jacob is the principal research scientist at NVIDIA, and, uh, and he's working on the intersection of machine learning and wireless communications. And prior to that, he was the head of a research department at Nokia Bell Labs France. And uh, so Jacob, over to you, and uh, feel free to share your slides. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, Jacob, yes. Okay, fantastic. And you can also see my slides, I hope. Yes, very well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased to be on, on this panel. It's a topic that perfectly fits my um, research activities and interests. And um, yeah, to get started, I would present you a, um, a, a, very, oh, sorry, a, a very simple uh, 6G vision that tries to make an analogy between what's currently happening in the world of processor development and um, what might happen when we transition from 5G to 6G. So thanks to um, Moore's law, we have seen increasing processor performance and efficiency over the last decades. Now um, Moore's law has essentially come to an end and domain specific accelerators that excel at a specific type of computation um, are one way to continue scaling performance and efficiency even further. Now, Wireless communication systems um, are traditionally designed to work robustly in, um, in quite a wide range of scenarios. And a bit like a general purpose processor, you can see them as a general purpose wireless bit pipe. And so now we believe that like a domain specific hardware accelerator specializes to a certain task, um, 6G systems should be able to um, uh, specialize to the radio environment in which they are deployed and to the application they serve. And um, in order to, to enable this specialization at scale, this must be fully automated, which can only be achieved through software-defined radio access networks and machine learning, and also digital twins or siblings are another um, enabling technology to achieve this. Um, but now let's focus just on the physical layer and think about from a research point of view, is it actually possible to have a communication systems that can actually adapt to any type of environment? So I would claim that um, based on the work that, that many groups in the world, um, including myself and my colleagues have conducted over the last year, that it's possible to learn the entire physical layer. So it means we can learn new codes, especially for short black lengths that achieve state-of-the-art performance. We can learn new modulation schemes that allow us to get rid of demodulation reference signals. We can learn new waveforms that embrace hardware imperfections while actually still being very spectrally efficient. And the key to all of these are fully neural network-based receivers that largely outperform traditional methods in most realistic scenarios. Um, I've put, by the way, a few references here to each of these points. Um, and then the next question many people would ask themselves is why should we actually learn a new physical layer? And one could argue that OFDM with um, QAM is good enough. And if you go to terahertz frequencies, we could just use another, you know, a simple single carrier scheme. And I would say that this is probably a valid point for the traditional cellular broadband type of networks. But the more we go towards highly specialized networks for distributed sensing or intelligent applications, a robot control, joint communication and sensing or power transfer, all this becomes less clear. Um, now, beyond that, I think there's another couple of good reasons. So first of all, a physical layer uh, that's learned can achieve unprecedented performance, especially once you take hardware constraints into account. And this will become a dominant factor in the terahertz band. 
Um, and I've also witnessed over the course of the last few years that it's actually much faster to train a neural network than to implement the baseline algorithms that we use for benchmarking. And because you can go more or less directly from data to a hardware implementation, this traditional algorithm development and deployment cycle can be dramatically shortened. Um, and lastly, um, I think that if you expect that 6G will support an even more diverse set of use cases than 5G, um, it will become very difficult to standardize for all of these cases. And so ideally, we could instead standardize a learning-based method that would allow the system itself to automatically adapt um, to specific environments. Now, what do we need actually to succeed and make this happen? Um, quite a few things. First of all, I would say that um, having a, a learned transceiver is something nobody has ever implemented um, in a product in the world. And to make this happen, it requires, I think, a paradigm change in the industry to enable it. So if you look, for example, at how long it has taken for MIMO to make it from research into a product or standard, it seems a bit challenging to be ready within the 6G timeline. Um, now, another big question um, is, what would we actually standardize? So would it be just the learning outcome, like a trained model, or would it be the signaling and procedures that enable the training? And lastly, I think that um, trust and reliability are very important issues, um, because from an economic perspective, it is actually impossible to develop simultaneously a machine learning based and a traditional solutions to the same problem. And before any company goes ML first, they need to trust their solutions and must be able to test and troubleshoot them efficiently. And yeah, that's it for me. And I hope that we can discuss some of these points in the panel. Wonderful, thanks Jacob. So one point stands out as you were talking, I was making notes here. You said, you know, there is a possibility now to take, to, to jump, uh, directly from data to a to a hardware deployment stage. Now, does that mean that that data that you are using for this sort of a jump has to be comprehensive enough that it must be representative of, of every practical use case that can exist? Because once you go to the hardware stage, you are somewhat less uh, you know flexible, let's say, in in your modification. So, so how do you make sure that jump is sound? Yeah, I think that's a very, very, very good question. So I, um, so we have done quite a few um, um, I think tests and trials over, over the last few years. And it turns out that in, I would say that in many cases, it might be good enough to have training on a very rich data set in an offline mode that, as you said, is representative of many cases you would expect. Similar as you test, you know, your algorithms on a wide variety of 3GPP models, you could just test it on a large enough data set and then be confident that it will most likely uh, work on other ICE cases. Now, but I think if you would really like to get the last, I don't know, five or 10% in performance, I think there's no way around um, online training um, in the field. So this gives you, that's what I meant actually with a network that the physical layer that can specialize fully to a scenario. So if you think about a receiver in some factory setting, you only want it to work in this particular setting. So it doesn't need to work in any other things. And if you now have a learning-based solution that could essentially overfit to this environment it sees, that brings you, I think, the real uh, performance gain. And I so think I think both is required. So I think there's a need for online, I would say, deployment site specific training. I think that what you just said also answers one of the questions that came up that can a layer one adapt to rapidly changing channel conditions. So I think this basically answers it. You need to have an online component. Yeah, now the thing is always, if you think about this enter and learn learning in the physical layer, most likely you don't want to change what is transmitted. So essentially the waveform. That's not something you should possibly learn all the time because the overhead for this is too large. But having this trained in an offline mode on a very realistic model, and then just have the receiver adapt to whatever is a mismatch between you know, the model and the real world, I think this compensates quite sufficiently for it. But training end-to-end -end all the time, I don't think that this scales and, and, and makes sense from a feedback perspective. So you can hold that thought. We're going to come back. Okay. Um, we're going to come back soon on this. But uh, so uh, we're going to move on to our next panelist. And uh, our next panelist is, uh, is uh, Dr. Nada Goldmead.
who received her PhD in computer science from Maryland at College Park. And now she's at NIST, where she's the chief of the wireless networks division in the communications technology laboratory. So she has many, many papers and uh, actively leads a lot of standardization efforts uh, involving simulation modeling and so on. So, uh, so Nada, over to you. Thank you, Koshik. Um, I am delighted to be here and participate in this panel. And a um, and, uh, few thoughts uh, to sort of set the stage for the conversation to come. Uh, next next uh, slide, please. Uh, so basically, you know, um, the vision, people are talking about 6G, next G, whatever G, basically we're going to continue to uh, see, uh, to handle huge amounts of data at, at uh, very high speed and very low latencies. As a result, you know, a lot of things are happening. They're going to be transformative, and and uh, and we're witnessing that from in many different sectors. You know, from smart cities to telehealth to to autonomous driving to agriculture, robotics, and the like. Right. So we're going to continue to. To see that, and and really, this transformation is being fueled by the 5G AI combo. I would say, and in fact, some people are predicting they've already put some numbers, dollar amounts on this on this combination. Uh, it's funny that this is coming from the from a government <laughs> panelist <laughs> that um, we do care about the economy. <laughs> so 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 th there is uh, basically you know uh, expectation that by 2035, you know, the revenue, direct revenue from 5G and AI combination is in trillions of dollars, right? So that's 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 great, and 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 that's I think you know uh, so that's happening already. Uh, if we look at the impact of AI in current networks deployed, that is already you know we're seeing that uh, AI has been used for some time already for the with the service providers and the telecom operators, and uh, this will continue. Uh, next slide, please. So so um, the 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 one thing that that people uh, have that have been using AI in, 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 in the deployed networks today, whether it's 4G, 5G, whatever G you want, is basically uh, you get real benefit if the data quality is there, right? So data quality is important. For people who don't have data, I mean, that's mostly has been the the, the case in the research community, I think there's more good news and more data that is coming uh, your way and we'll, we'll, we'll get to it um, uh, in, in a bit. So, so it's important to keep in mind, you know, that, you know, as, as, as also Koshik uh, introduced, you know, it's important to not all data is created equal and the data quality is, is important. That's what people that are using AI today in networks are reporting. Next slide, please. So, um, Continuing with this, you know, AI using AI in uh, 5G and next G, and and this is going to continue, right? So so uh, as as Koshik introduced, you know, AI for 5G or 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 5G for AI. This this is this is transformational, and as the network of the future is going to, you know, support so many different scenarios and applications, there has to be, you know, a native. Uh, support for AI, right? Because it, 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 we're using AI in so many different sectors. We're using the communication, you know, in so many different applications, whether it's for connectivity, adaptability, high capacity spectrum, we're going to see uh, more of this native. And, and Jacob provided a very nice, you know, a case for the learned, uh, ran, uh, learn phi, right? So, and, and we're going to see more of that. Um, next slide, please. So, so what happens next is that, um, you know, we are going to have these, you know, enhanced uh, uh, communication intelligence, these smart communications uh, fueled by uh, AI with, you know, next G, 6G. Um, and then uh, the components there, obviously, you know, are, are measurements, models, because we need the, these uh, and we also need new new metrology, new methods for uh, for per, for evaluating these this combined uh, uh, communication um, stack, right? If we're no longer dealing with something that is static, we're evaluating its performance, and then we're dealing with something that is can be learned. So how do we assess? You know, it's performing as it is. As uh, Jacob listed, a, a number of challenges. So we need new metrology, new new ways to to measurement to, to, to measure and assess new models uh, 
to, to utilize also machine learning and also to uh, uh, develop uh, communications data sets. At NIST, we have a number of projects that tackle different pieces uh, of this puzzle. Uh, obviously, we have very uh, uh, long and, and history with propagation uh, uh, models and measurements. We have data sets that we provide uh, to the community for this type of uh, application in, in, in machine learning. Uh, next slide, please. So, so uh, the the story uh, here is is sort of is one of of uh, a partnership and collaborations. I think some, many of us are already involved with the Rings project that was mentioned. Uh, we have also um, uh, uh, consortiums that uh, basically. Um, uh, 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 provide data in terms of measurements and, and, and models with the uh, uh, NextG Channel Model Alliance. I'm delighted to uh, see uh, Koshik's uh, uh, a, um, announcement about the uh, RF Data Factory, and I'm be very uh, happy to work with, uh, with that uh, uh, effort in order to really uh, look into more dissemination of, of data sets for these types of efforts. Uh, and, um, and I think I will uh, summarize basically, you know, just the, to, to the key uh, uh, takeaways is that, uh, you know, AI and, and ML is being used today in various forms of network design configuration operation. Good data quality is absolutely needed. Um, Next G is going to do more of that, if not less. And also, we're looking at a more native approach for supporting uh, AI for the different uh, scenarios and, and applications. And then, um, measurement methods and data are key. And, and we have as what it takes as a community uh, to come together to do this. So, thank you very much, and looking forward to the. Uh, uh, conversation. Uh, thank you, Nada. Uh, so uh, w w one question comes up here. Uh, you know, you mentioned that there, there is metrology, there is, uh, you know, uh, the science of data sets. You mentioned technologies themselves, massive MIMO, you mentioned uh, terahertz and so on. Each of these are domains in, in themselves. Now, when you start to, to, to bridge across these different domains, a question that comes to my mind is, do we have a trained workforce to, to really tackle them together jointly at a go? And I only bring this up because, because the, I mean, uh, from, from NIST, you well appreciate that, that the science of measurements needs a uh, very careful design of experiments, very careful understanding of, of even the act of how the measurements should be done. So how do we train then this next you know, workforce to be proficient in these wide varieties that you mentioned um, and, and so that they, are, they, are, they become productive uh, members of this wireless community and really uh, you know, push this collective vision forward. Uh, Koshik, this is an excellent point uh, because, you know, uh, again, we need to train the, the workforce into uh, the use of, of machine learning. We need to sort of train the wireless engineers into data science. Um, I, I'm told that uh, part is easier than training data science into wireless engineering. I don't know why. I, th I think everything is possible if one really wants to learn. <laughs> but yes, and this is, has, has already been 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 happening right so um obviously in every uh, organization that is serious about solving these problems this is already you know the train has left the station so to speak in terms of you know looking at this and uh, but and that should start perhaps with the academic institutions so what are you doing in your in in in, in the universities to to start that so that we're not really looking at this joint uh uh, competencies and uh, but uh, 10 years ago this was very difficult right because people were talking about apples and oranges and not really understanding each other uh, today things are have moved quite a bit um, but we still have a long way to go thank you Nada you're a tough panelist you've thrown the question back at me as the as, as the academic hat wearing member but uh, but yes we will we'll work with you on this uh, but let's move on to our, our, our next panelist for today uh, and, and we are very uh, happy and, and, and honored to have uh, Bill Wright, who is the head of AIML and uh, 
uh, and an intelligent edge global verticals at Red Hat. And, and really he is uh, designing technical strategy across vertical industries and global accounts at Red Hat. He's also a member of the Red Hat AI, uh, uh, ILT, and co-founder of the Enterprise Neurosystem Open Source AI Research Community. There are many more accolades to, to Bill, but I'm going to let Bill talk about his work himself. So Bill, over to you. Thank you. Wow. Well, well uh, thank you very much. I'm honored and, uh, and honestly humbled to be here. I think the other speakers have actually <laughs> taught me quite a bit today, and it's been fascinating to listen. Um, you know, it, it's funny to see Red Hat in this conversation for many because they look at us as a infrastructure provider. And they don't realize the kind of depth of work in AI ML and also in 5G and ultimately 6G that we're up to at the moment. But um, one of the interesting things that happened for me, I think about five or six years ago, was I went to visit a, uh, a friend at America Mobile who was uh, responsible for global infrastructure for a good portion of their network there. And we were having a conversation over lunch at uh, this beautiful restaurant called Loma Linda uh, in Mexico City. And we were going back and forth and he said, you know, it, it's really interesting. Red Hat is really well positioned to kind of unify and bring together all the disparate elements that are taking place right now in AI and ML. And I don't know if you've really thought about that through the lens of mobile communications. And I said, frankly, no, I haven't thought about that yet. And uh, we began to have a, a dialogue. And I've always found that the customer dialogues like that are the most productive in terms of understanding and getting a gauge on, I think, where the industry is headed. And so most of my career, I've tried to base uh, our activities on what customers truly need and desire and not to, to lead from within, so to speak. And in this effort, what we've done is we've come up with something that's really an open source community called the Enterprise Neurosystem. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. You get a sense of where Red Hat's business and AI and ML is gone. And I don't mean to make this Red Hat specific, but it just kind of puts it in context. Uh, again, many people haven't thought of us working in these areas, but again, in almost every element of our business, and I won't go into each one, we have different aspects of AI and ML that have basically infused our entire product line. And uh, next slide. What we arrived on was really kind of a meta level approach in view of where this is all headed. And we stood back and said to ourselves, well, look, from an infrastructure vantage point, where do we see the core problems arising? It wasn't in the radio, 5G, 6G, you know, basically the transmission rates, et cetera. What we saw was a preponderance of AI and ML applications, both at the edge and at the core, and the large majority of them were completely lacking integration. Many of them were point solutions. Many of them were really at the application layer communicating with one another, but there was no core, I guess you could say meaning or context being derived from the totality of AI applications in the enterprise. And we took a look around and we said, well, look, you've got AI applications coming from vendors that are DIY and built internally. You've got them out at the edge, you've got them at the core. How do we basically provide meaning and context from that? So we decided to go ahead and start a community, open source community with a variety of partners called the Enterprise Neurosystem. And the concept is to really create a singularity, uh, to come up with a core AI ML federation of intelligence that basically connects to all the different AI and ML instances in an enterprise, whether it be a mobile network, whether it be a, a CPG a consumer package goods company, a bank or financial institution, and basically take all the data and cross correlate it in a meaningful way and present it up to management. That's really the idea. And, and so really what we're looking to do is, especially with 6G and the advances that are taking place there, we can now begin to see the emerging of the edge and the core, the merging of devices basically, and create that single intelligence utilizing all resources in the network to basically provide that real-time view of operations in the enterprise at any given time. So we're starting with the telco and scientific communities, but again, this can extend to almost any you know, enterprise scenario in a variety of different Fortune 500 uh, companies. And next slide, please. So this is where we're starting. Uh, this is the cookie box. <laughs> this is a very uh, interesting device that was a, uh, you know, basically used by Stanford and their linear accelerator for X-ray, uh, basically X-ray laser research. And it's in their LCLS lab. And uh, next slide, please. 
One of the interesting things about the cookie box detector is that it has a frame rate, or I guess a data capture rate of 120 frames a second at the moment, but that's about to expand to a million frames a second over time and over a terabyte of data coming in a second through this device to basically capture the different events at a molecular level and understand what is taking place on, in terms of like the new physics discoveries that need to be advanced. And, and so the, uh, the conundrum here, even though it seems to be only a science project, this really the same paradigm extends to mobile networks. It extends to the enterprise. And if you think about the incredible data rates at the edge being taken back to the core and then processed there, there's an interesting load balanced effect you have to look at in terms of the kinds of algorithms that will be posted at the edge and what'll be basically taking place at a neural net le level at the core and what programs are really optimal for that. And so we're looking at all these different areas. Uh, next slide, please. And, and so really what we're looking to do from a new code perspective to create within this community is a central cross-correlation engine, whether that'll be a federated group of AI instances or a central AI model that will basically take all this and cross-correlate it. We're looking at all that right now. Uh, we're actually looking at the middleware layer, and middleware is probably the wrong term for it, but we're looking at you know, layer seven, I mean, all these different areas where we can basically integrate all the different applications in an effective and secure manner. Uh, we're gonna be building additional AI models for missing functions, and also, of course, synthetic data environments for model training. Next slide, please. And so really the benefits here, I think are pretty clear to everybody on the, on the phone, I would imagine, <laughs> or on the conference call. Uh, wide frame real-time business insights will be really valuable. We're actually looking at creating a hologram advisor that will then in turn turn around and advise uh, you know, the C-suite and management as to what's happening in real time around the enterprise uh, to streamline operations and enable those cost savings. Um, pretty much everything you would imagine with both a combination of AI ops and business intelligence, that's the idea with the system. But if you think about it, all these different elements have really been sitting on the periphery and these tea leaves have been drifting together for some time now. So we're just looking to create an intelligence in the middle and then basically integrate everything at the edge. That's the idea. And then last slide. So the reason for all this development and the reason we started with telco from this perspective is if you think about the pervasiveness of a telecommunications network today and the size and scope of these kinds of networks, um, we've got companies like Equinix and America Mobile and we've had Yahoo, et cetera. These are some of the biggest wireless networks and CDNs you can imagine. And the idea was to really start looking at the meta scale question of how would we manage climate change but also if you look at the terrestrial and extraterrestrial networking that's gonna take place with 6G, I mean, you're gonna have amazing uptime at almost every location on the planet and maybe a little bit beyond. Could we do extraterrestrial object detection as well, like meteors and, and impacts like that? How could, we, how could we create a system that basically would manage and operate all this? So again, this is a research and development consortium. We don't plan to answer these questions you know, next week with a new product. The idea is to incorporate academia, government, and industry to basically sit down and talk about these issues and come up with a system that could eventually have a really positive impact on how we interoperate with our planet. So that's really the idea and the concept. Uh, we're working on it actively now. We have a kickoff actually tomorrow to support the Cookie Box POC with uh, Harvard and Harvard Analytics. We have UC Berkeley's Data X program now involved. We've got, um, gosh, I could go down the list. We have Intel, other partners that are helping us. And uh, IBM Research is also contributing uh, one of their scientists as well. It's been a fantastic effort. So we uh, are going to continue this on over the next few years and see where it leads us. Thank you, Bill. Um, so, so you, 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 when you mentioned um, central AI, I got a little nervous because I thought, now, now this is where you know the, the next reference is going to be Skynet or something, something like that. <laughs> but. But your vision of central AI is not is is saying that um, you know you are not at the edge, you are you are you can work with any edge that might come up. So if you can just demystify a little bit the word centrally doing complex AI for very large distributed systems like wireless architectures. Uh, so if you could bridge the two concepts it would make it a lot more clearer if you could just comment on that a little bit. 
Certainly, and I'd actually had a slide about this that I culled from this deck because I didn't want to go on too long past five minutes. But um, in essence, we'll be taking a look at all the, the lower level functions like FFTs and different forms of uh, AI that'll be deployed in the field. We'll then basically do a tiered architecture and that's at least the first pass at this architecture we're looking at. And so it'll actually, every segment of the business will basically be funneled into yet another segment and yet another segment into a tiered architecture that basically gets into GANs and transformers and takes it up into a reporting instance that then cross correlates all the larger data sets and the metadata to basically create an output in real time that can be interpreted at the top level. So it's really a tiered approach for the time being. Uh, there are folks within the community that, community that are advocating a central model that will manage all of it from an efficiency perspective and an accuracy perspective. We're going back and forth on all that right now. So I think it's an interesting dialogue we're having and uh, we'll be doing things in the lab to basically try to prove that out and understand what that looks like. But we'll be basing it on the research we'll be doing. Yeah, very, very interesting. I'm sure there will be lots of uh, you know active debate on both sides of the aisle on this. So uh, looking forward to that. Great. So, um, well, uh, all the panelists have provided their vision talks and, and there's certainly, um, you know, pearls of wisdom that at least I have extracted. I have a bunch of questions myself and I do see a couple in the, uh, in the, uh, in the chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pick out a few and I'll, I'll leave it open to, uh, to the panelists. If anyone wants to jump in, please feel free to do so. And then uh, you can also uh, voice other concerns or, or opinions that may not be specifically addressing the question. You welcome that as well. And especially if you don't agree with your, what your colleague has said on the panel for, uh, you know, go ahead, please, and, 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 and say it aloud. Okay, so with that said, um, so one of the questions is, uh, do you envision data collection platform being integral part of all network deployments towards next G network architectures. So in other words, will this data collection must necessarily exist in network deployments? Um, or, or do you think that that is perhaps not the role of, of the network operator who is sort of trying to optimize uh, the operator's own performance? Uh, any thoughts on that? I just want to clarify when you mean data collection, of course, the operators collect a lot of data on the network performance and so forth, and they will continue to do that. Uh, is, does it mean like, you know, whether they collect user data and you know, they also do that, but there will be increasing concerns of privacy. And that's why some of these new technologies such as, you know, distributed privacy preserving learning are coming up and see whether they, they will have a role. And then, so I don't know whether that is the clarification of the question. So you're, you're right, Nagin, maybe I should call, I, the way I interpret this is that should this data collection platform be more accessible to perhaps outside the operator's own domain? I think I, I interpret the question as, as in that manner. But yes, I think you, are, you, you, you did touch upon the point, uh, you know, privacy preserving learning, et cetera. I also see uh, Nada with her hands, uh, Nada, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So as, as Nagin said, there's a lot of data that's being collected and will continue to be collected. But maybe one thought, perhaps for the future networks, is that maybe no data needs to be collected, right? Because things are being learned or sensed or being in, 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 in dealt with right there. Right now, all we do is we take the data, we shuffle it back, and then we process it later, and then we find the insight, and then we act on it. Perhaps maybe that's not needed, right, if things are going to be learned uh, more quickly. Just a thought. Indeed, indeed. Uh, no, uh, yes. Megan, uh, you want to uh, follow up? Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, uh, of course, uh, there needs to be some data for validation and so forth. But yeah, you could really reduce the amount of data that needs to flow by using local learning and analytics. And that's really the way to go. I mean, there is just uh, not, no need to ship so much data around. True, and you know, just a few seconds of IQ sample data itself is gigabytes. And uh, at this rate, there'll be nothing left. <laughs> uh, or perhaps, I'll, you know, I shouldn't be saying these comments in public. There are there are other more, uh, you know, better people have said things about storage and have been proved wrong. But uh, but I do agree that a storage could become a concern pretty quickly. Um, okay. Uh, another question is that uh, there were so there were mentions of technologies like terahertz and and whether six G will involve 
frequencies are that high uh, with those extreme bandwidths. And um, so at those bandwidths, uh, uh, computing time probably is the dominant uh, factor in the end-to-end -end uh, end -end latencies. So clearly, if computing time is the dominant factor, then running AIML at line speed or in the loop is going to be even more difficult. Um, so, you know, just a thought here that if 6G were to have terahertz, how would you do some of these, you know, machine learning uh, methods as part of your um, online system? Um, any thoughts on way to ways to handle that. Uh, uh, Jacob, uh, you can go first. Okay, sure, I, I can start. Um, it's, it's a good question. So um, I, I see two, two, two possibilities. So one is, of course, in the waveform design itself, but that, that doesn't mean that you need any form of online learning. Essentially, you would, you would actually come up with a new, with a new waveform um, that's entirely learned based on, on models and, and validated with, with, you know, with, with some data. But, but once you have it, Essentially, um, there's no learning anymore, and then and I think that that's easy. And then the the second part is um, um, now for the um, for the detection, um, it becomes actually extremely challenging at, at terahertz to deal with um, hardware imperfections. So that's an example would be excessive phase noise, and there has been quite some work already, um, but I expect much more to come up. That actually shows that there's a benefit of using, um, for example. Um, neural networks for, for detection. And now whether you can actually operate this at these terahertz kind of um, throughputs that's required, that then boils, out, boils down to, do you have an efficient hardware implementation for it or not? And um, I think we still don't have it. We don't have these, I would say, communication specific hardware accelerators, but I think it's just a matter of time that this will come. And then I could, it could actually even become possible that this will be a lower complexity implementation compared to um, a traditional algorithm. So, um, yeah, but I don't expect any online learning. So I don't see that most likely you won't do online learning um, on top. So I, I'd rather see it, you, you know, you, you train it from time to time and then, then you deploy it and use it, so. Thanks, Jacob. Um... Just to follow up on that, I think the the uh, audience member who asked the question also offers a solution. Says that you know should we move to quantum devices or um, and, and that that opens up a whole new can of worms. But if uh, uh, but but that's one thing that we haven't touched upon in in this whole discussion of AIML with regards to six uh, T. But where does the quantum story fit in, or are we too early yet for that? Um, any thoughts on, on this from uh, from the panel? Do you mean too late? Are we too late? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good perspective indeed. Uh, but but is there something that we should start to start start to incorporate already? Knowing that there are you know there are there are economic challenges in creating these sorts of computing engines, uh, but should we start to build a theory already for this? I mean, I, I, I have some thoughts. I, I think it's, we are not ready for this and it's too costly. It won't work at scale. And then we also need to think about, you know, these terahertz links, they, you know, we won't use them for coverage, right? It will be mainly, I don't know, I, I don't have many good use cases in mind, but I think some that, you know, you kind of are in the air, you know, these data showers, you know, you, you are in some shopping mall and for some reason you want to download terabytes of data, then you go to this, data shower, boom, you get everything you need in a couple of seconds. And I mean, that's really a niche use case. And the question is, do you want to have some quantum devices there that costs a lot of money or can you do something else? So I, I, I think it's a bit too early. I mean, the, the quantum disruption is coming, but I personally don't expect it to be there for 6G. So um... that's certainly Point of view, Jacob. Well taken. Uh, Nagin, do you have a counter to that, or or are you? No, are I was going to throw it to patterns? academics. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I was going to throw it to an academic for doing quantum research because, uh, yeah, I'm not that familiar with this. Like, I don't. I do, I also sort of concur with Jacob here that it's probably early. Indeed. Not, yeah. Okay. If if you want to assign a G to it, maybe six G is too soon. But if we say next G, some G. <laughs> 
then maybe maybe it is and the research has already started question is is it you know commercial commercial ready probably not right but um you know it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be worked on and 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 as for the terahertz i mean as long as we don't assign you know a, a spectrum or frequency to a g i think everything is on the table everything is fair game right so we should use whatever makes sense so for terahertz things that are probably very short distance you know sensing you know things that where terahertz is, is best but we're not going to try to deploy it maybe uh in an urban area <laughs> at least not not in five years that makes sense no, that's 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 insightful. So, so here's a question from the audience, and this one is actually pretty close to my heart. Uh, you know, we are talking about um, using machine learning to it, it purely in the RF domain, but if you if you look around, you find massive amounts of uh, you know cameras and acoustic sensors, lidar, etc. Right, we're surrounded with these. When will these multimodal sensors start to come inside a regular uh, wireless optimization loop and, and become part of a multimodal decision process? Uh, is, it, is 6G going to do it or should we wait longer? And, uh, and why is it that we don't see that much of, um, let's say, uh, you know, active, or perhaps there is an active development, but, but an active incorporation into the standard of these multimodal sensors for RF uh, based uh, application. So uh, this, is a, this is a loaded question. So I'd be happy if each of you take a crack at it. Um, uh, Jacob, you want to go first on this and then we can yeah, go uh, sure. build um, another again. Sure, I mean, okay, there are multiple parts to the question. So um, um, in terms of standardization, I think there are even already discussions about this and how could you um, yeah, incorporate additional sources um, uh, of sensing information such as cameras into the network. I think it just hasn't materialized yet, but definitely already two years ago, I, I was aware of a couple of, uh, involved in a couple of discussions and um, it makes sense. Now the question is, I think, is this fast enough? So in many cases, you know, I'm having a camera or something like this, this is really slow compared to how, how fast, you know, wireless works. So if you get 30 frames per second, you know, that's, that's too little. So in, in wireless, it happens on the microsecond scale. So in many cases, um, that's possibly a bit too slow. So I, I don't see right now a lot of use for optimizing wireless using additional sensing information. I think possibly, but I mean, there are maybe cool applications arise. It just, I haven't really seen it yet. So, but I think there might actually, it might actually be other, the other way around. So saying most likely 6G will be an additional sensor um, that can complement camera and LiDAR. So for example, um, uh, there's some, there was some nice work or people have actually, you have these, you know, you have a virtual um, uh, kind, of kind of a headset for augmented reality, and then you use RGB cameras to get these depths, um, you use depth cameras to actually um, be able to, um, you know, to visualize something like a virtual object in the real world, you need to, to estimate the depths where you are. But when it gets dark, kind of, um, these cameras don't work so well. And then one could actually use millimeter wave or terahertz frequencies to do, to, to replace it, take over the role of these cameras. So I see it in, I think, more, in, more in, the other, say, in the other way around. And yeah, and I mean, otherwise going to 6G, I mean, um, that's one of the big use cases. Uh, in 6G, we go to higher frequencies, the base station will essentially become a sensor. I mean, that, that's key to it. So um, I think that's one of the things I expect, really expect to happen. Great. So you, you, you did touch upon the sensing question. We are going to come back to it. That, that deserves a whole set of responses from the panel uh, in itself. You know, the, the role of sensing, because we spoke a lot about communication. So we will definitely touch on it. Uh, but let's come back to this, uh, this question on multimodal sensing for uh, or multimodal sensors to, to shape uh, wireless optimization. So, um, um, so Bill, would you like to go next and then we go? Uh... Uh, you, you saw me smiling here. I wrote a white paper uh, internally at a company I was at about 10 years ago about uh, this topic and something kind of similar. What I was proposing at the time was to basically take mobile devices and use them as resources as part of a cloud pool, you could say. And it's really funny because when you think about it, there are I mean, millions upon millions of chipsets sitting there. And as I'm talking with you on this uh, conference right now, this is sitting here totally latent, not being utilized whatsoever. 
it could be part of a pool of resources that could be used from both a sensory perspective, but also from a compute perspective as well. I think 6G will open the door to that, but then there are also the issues of, do I wanna opt my device in for something like that? How do I protect my onboard data? How do we take a look at that? Um, there are some issues of privacy that come to the fore, but um, again, we give away our privacy all the time when we opt into you know, all the usual programs that we do on the social media side. So it's fascinating to me. I, I think, you know, in some respects, we have to be very guarded and careful about it. And I think in others, we've already given that freedom away for some of the things that we use on a free basis every day. How do we personally want to navigate that? But the resource pool, I think, for devices is massive. I'm just, I think that's something that's an untapped resource we need to take a closer look at. And 6G will help unleash that, I think, over time. That sounds great, Bill. Um... Nada, would you like to go next and then we go to Nagin? Sure, two, two comments. One is that we are already using, you know, uh, AI-based uh, video and, and cameras to do propagation modeling, for example. So that's, you know, we, we, we need to, we, we look at LIDAR data and the RF data and then in order to come up with uh, good models. So that's already happening. And then you said you wanted to take the sensing, um, but there's basically lots of work on joint, you know, uh, wireless uh, radar type uh, sensing and applications, comms and sensing uh, that's already happening and standards too. So we'll talk about it perhaps later. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, but, but before we move from you, Renata, you're saying that this is going to be a, an integral part of 6G or should we wait further on? See, I'm, I'm not so sure when people talk about 6G, maybe they have something in mind, they already have some requirements. To me, the next G is the next G. At some point, you know, the marketing folks will come in and will say, hey, this is 6G. So I don't know, from my point of view, it is the next G, meaning it's not there yet, uh, or it will be there maybe in, in five, 10 years. But I'll leave it up to the marketing folks to determine if that's 6G or not. All right. It is impressive, right, okay. it is impressive marketing. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, I was I was laughing and agreeing completely with the marketing aspect, but but uh, yeah, it, it I just seeing that that funnel increase has been nice though. I think it does open up a lot of freedom. But Indeed. yeah, I, my apologies. Please continue. No, no, this is great. Please feel free to ch uh, chime in. So, Megan, over to you, please. Yeah, I guess I don't have too much to add uh, beyond what people have already said. So having, you know, mobile devices as sensors and, you know, base stations offering a platform for additional sensors is definitely very promising. On the other side, which I was going to make the point which Jacob made that, you know, wireless as a sensor is actually uh, very uh, interesting because it's also uh, a part, it, A, first of all, it's pervasive and B, it also has privacy properties, which, which makes it very interesting. So just to add that point. Great. So since we are on the topic of uh, sensing and wireless as sensing, right? Let's just drive home a little bit further down. Um, so, so, so how do you see it? Do you see that the that the data that or the information that you would be able to collect from using the wireless as a sensor, you will you will learn on them, and then you will optimize your actual wireless network operations using this. And would you be able to do this in a in, in, in time scales that are meaningful enough? Uh, and, and 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 if so, does it need to be at the at the radio front end itself, or can it be? Can you offload some of this into some sort of a cloud at the back? Uh, is are there some examples that you can share? Uh, anyone from the panel that? So, so, so you, you, you mentioned something about sort of using the RF to do sensing, but that's fine, but big also for many different applications, right? So we're using the RF, the wireless, to do detection, presence, you do counting, to do uh, surveillance, to do, you know, without the camera. So if we're using this, you know, the RF from the communication to, to for different sensing types of applications. So that's an area that's very promising, it seems, and it's already started because we're also, uh, no wanna pay the price twice, right? The, the comms price and the sensing price. So we wanna just say, okay, since you're communicating, we're gonna use that signal, uh, that RF, to order to, to figure out other things about the environment. And then we can come back and optimize the wireless, right? So, so optimized wireless could be one application, but could be also for other types of applications. I, I think I, I appreciate that point. So, so it could even be, it may have nothing to do with the wireless optimization. It could just be 
understanding the environment for a variety of the different other purposes. Yeah. For telehealth patients, you know, you know, are they breathing? Are they not breathing? How many people are here? This is COVID reaching the limit of uh... right. many, many examples. So, well, thank you. I, I, these help to, for me to visualize uh, some of the use cases. Uh, any other thoughts on that from the other panelists? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I fully agree with what Nada said. Possibly, I see more interesting um, cases arising there. But um, I think. Um, there is already a lot of, I would say, use of RF sensing for optimization of the network itself going on. So, for example, um, um, you can detect, for example, you can estimate how fast the user is moving, right? That's essentially radar. And depending on that, you would choose um, at the, fre the frequency with which you send um, channel quality feedback, uh, channel estimation, etc. cetera. Um, then you can use RF to localize users. That's what's happening. And this type of information, you know, you can know it to make better scheduling decision, you know, which users should be jointly uh, multiplexed to, to ensure some, you know, I would say, um, you know, orthogonality between these channels. So in some sense, that's already happening, but it's not like the marketing hasn't gone well, you know, we're doing this to some extent already, but it hasn't, you don't need six key for it, or you, you don't have specific radar there. So I think it, it's going on, and most likely, um, I would say that, that, that this is just going to, to continue. So people will discover, okay, now we can actually not only detect the speed, but now we can really pinpoint towards the user. I can really figure out, um, you know, if there's a blockage coming and I need to hand over to some other cell, these kind of things. But most likely they, this won't be a marketing argument. It's just something that will naturally happen. Um, so I think for 60 then to brand it, it will more like the, what can it do on top of communications? Then, um, Sounds good. Sounds good, Jacob. Uh, so uh, let me let me switch gears to to a different topic, and it came up when we were talking about, um, and and I, I broadly call this as the role of the human. Okay. Now, when you talk about AI and machine learning, the the thought process is naturally that you know the, here's here's where the algorithms and 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 the devices, uh, the computing infrastructure takes over removes complex decision-making from the individual network operator, is able to reconfigure, change, adapt faster than what perhaps a, a human perhaps could, uh, could, could uh, anticipate in both near-term and long-term scales, or perhaps even handle vast amounts of data that is really impossible for a human. Now, what is the role of the human operator in, in, this, in this future world where AI ML is firmly entrenched into a 6G standard? Uh, is the human only an end consumer and, and that's it? Or is there some guiding role that a human can play to shape what the AI ML does? So, so this could be a question for the entire panel here. And um, if anyone would like to go first, please unmute and then we'll, we'll do it that way. So, I guess just sorry, yeah. maybe I'll just state the obvious that I guess there is still some questions about you know uh, how uh, how bounded and how reliable AI solutions are, and until those things are better understood, you may still need uh, AI to provide some recommendations and you know get some human in the loop to address. Uh, so I think uh, if you do see you know for a foreseeable future that human should stay involved, uh, but as things get better understood, I mean that's obvious that it will get relaxed. But yeah. But we still have to deal with the human in terms of, you know, the delivery, right, of services, right, because we're dealing with the human as an end, like you said, but uh, so, so the human is there, but also a lot is happening between the machines themselves, right, and for the comms to be smart or intelligent, that's, we want to remove the human, as much of the human that is needed for doing very simple tasks, repetitive uh, things like that, we want to remove the human, right, but we want to make sure that the human is getting what it, what, what it, what it, he or she needs. <laughs> but then um, these things are supposed to be autonomous of sorts, right, the, the, the comms. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, Bill, go ahead. Oh, uh, I, I was just going to, like, once again, step back and look at the, 
the meta level again. I guess that's all I'm good at, basically. <laughs> What's funny about it, though, is if you think about it, uh, agriculture, you know, in the United States, I think 80% of the population was engaged in agriculture and related activities in 1800. Uh, today, I think it's 10.9%. And if you look at that evolution over time, it really came down to automation in many respects. And so what happened to the rest of that population? Well, it doesn't mean they're necessarily sitting around at home. They've found, you know, they've been retrained, they're doing other activities, they have other professions, et cetera. But that's taken place over many, many years. I do think if you take a look at, for example, image recognition in the medical domain and x-ray detection of different, uh, let's say, anomalies or different health conditions, uh, I think the error rate for the machine algorithms currently stands at around six or seven percent. For humans, it's closer to 3% for x-ray experts you know, at a, at a PhD level. But if you combine the two, the error rate drops below 1%. And so the marriage of human and machine, I think, which is the fascinating proposition, is that it becomes an advisor, it becomes a synergistic relationship between the two because of the strengths inherent on both sides. So I think over time, we'll see a, a melding of the two as opposed to one displacing the other. Just a thought. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Jacob, any, any concluding thoughts on that? Um, uh, nothing really smart to say. So I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, just, I just think, you know, it's not like I was thinking about what, what Bill just said about farming. So I, 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 I struggle to make the analogy between operating a network and, you know, it's just, you know, a few hundreds of people doing this. And when we speak about autom automation, I mean, automating thing, it's like, most of network operators, you know, they have maybe a couple of hundred people that, you know, change parameters, settings in a network, get their KPIs, look at this, and then made informed guesses about what's really happening and, and try new things and do this again and again. And, and, and I think in, in, it seems natural that most likely machine could do this job in the future, but we're not speaking about, um, you know, percentages of the population. So I think it, so that, yeah, so, so I. <laughs> no, it's a fair point. I think so. My takeaway here is that I think the panel uniformly is agreeing that the human still has to be involved um, and sort of guide the AI ML into, into uh, say, maybe faster convergence or perhaps uh, identify what sort of data to consume given uh, various options. So, so there is certainly a role to play. Uh, but I think it's an open research question now that where should the interruption or the interjection of the human is most effective and when it is actually a collective action rather than, you know, uh, sort of not allowing a child to really learn from his mistakes. So um, I, I think I, I, I do feel that that's an open question as, as well. And perhaps the, as a community, we could look into it a little bit more from the context of a network and says, you know, if I don't interject here, what would happen in the network? If I do, then what would happen? And really understand these use cases. Uh, but yeah, fascinating question about what does a human do? Uh, so here's another thought from the audience. And uh, the audience asks that, um, well, how do you handle the uncertainty in machine learning in a way that will help 6G networks to be more responsive? And in parentheses, it says low latency in dynamic environments, and especially for safety mission critical applications. So bottom line, uncertainty in machine learning exists. We know that there is, uh, and, and how, how would that uh, be incorporated or somehow managed or even utilized by 6G networks in, in, in extreme, uh, environments like ultra low latency or extremely dynamic environments, um, mission critical environments, et cetera. So handling uncertainty is a question. Um, is, is there, uh, I mean, it's, go ahead, uh, Jacob, I think you, you're saying something. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm not fully certain how you, how you can leverage uncertainty in a positive way. So this is a question I think it's, I, 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 I rephrase the phrase. You, you, you measure it. You measure it first. I would say, how can we use machine learning to actually make 60 systems to be more responsive, uh, responsive and robust in mission critical applications, but not how can we use the uncertainty of machine learning for? So maybe there's something the question I don't get. So um, so this is one use case um, I, 
I um I I really um you know dream about what what I think might be happening. You know, um, I, I mentioned this in, in my introductory slides. You know, I, I think there's a huge um, potential for digital twins. So I always think about this, you know, fully automated factory. You have a digital twin of it, meaning you know everything that's happening in there, the robots moving around, etc. But you can fully essentially simulate it. And now you can. Now the question is, how can you design a network that ensures you know communication with as if it was cabled, so no errors. And now because you can learn everything, you can use machine learning to decide you know where would you place your your um, your, uh, your, your access points, but you can actually fully anticipate what's happening and actually all of the resource allocation problems you need to do, when to hand over, what to do. This is not a, you actually take the randomness out of the entire problem and the randomness in communications is uncertainty, right? Now everything becomes deterministic and then you can essentially use machine learning to predict everything. And so there is no randomness and uncertainty anymore. So I would say, Using digital twins with machine learning allows us to get rid of the uncertainty we have in classical communication schemes. So that's kind of um, interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. But one use because I I can be yeah, obviously the concrete use because I can kind of imagine what could happen. So that's that's it. So, um, yeah, I was going to add to what uh, Jacob is saying. Uh, uh, so there are basically uh, ways to reduce uncertainty, and Nada actually just alluded to one, which is you know having more diverse diversity in the system, like multiple digital twins, human, and you mentioned, Bill, that, you know, human combined with AI plus combined with digital twin will reduce the uncertainty. And that's basically using diversity of options. And then second, I would say that there are, of course, now uh, efforts to have safe AI or, you know, bounded, kind of bounding the AI output of AI solutions. So mathematically, there is a lot of work that is being done to sort of at least uh, see how robust a particular solution is. And those techniques would be important. Yeah, Jacob. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. I was about to ask uh, other input from the panel. Please go ahead, Bill. No, I, I thought Jacob's uh, line of reasoning was fascinating, and I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I just sharing a personal story. I was thinking to myself uh, a little while ago. I, I was thinking, what if you could create a digital twin of the human body, and you could do it for each individual based on the kind of wear and tear they've had over the years? Because I recently took up playing rugby again in my 50s, and it was funny. I look back when I was 18 to 25 and all the crazy things I had done to myself. And I was like, what if a digital twin could actually tell me what my injury rate's gonna be at this age going back to the rugby field and um, playing touch rugby, not tackle rugby, but just for the fun of it. But what was interesting is um, the digital, digital twin model could apply to all these different areas of you know, biology and different systems. And I mean, across the board, it could become a massive, uh, you know, data problem, but a massive data solution as well. So uh, I think he's he's definitely on the right track there. Great. I mean, you know, I'm just thinking aloud. Maybe I can send my digital twin to my office hours while I sit in the back. You know, <laughs> no, no, that, that's called cloning. <laughs> So, no, we'll just have to wait for Jacob's technology to catch up. Uh, it's probably not 6G, but maybe some other G. So, so, some next G, I fully agree with you. Uh, so, so one question that a lot of our students have, and, and I ask this because, um, you know, we have some of the, the top companies here in this panel who uh, are many of our students who, when they graduate, they aspire to work for, right? And, and, as, and as such, they see the, the activities and the approach that large companies take that are really the movers and shakers in this whole area. Uh, they, they would like to, you know, they, they see this and they would love to emulate it and so on. So he said, my question is this, um, when it comes to data sharing and transparency, it's always going to be a barrier that is going to exist because, you know, companies exist uh, for, 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 for a reason. Now, not all data can be shared and not all data, perhaps, uh, you know, there, there are certain economic parts and, and, uh, and, and ties that, that limit these. I, I do understand that. But, the, but the, the general thought process is that it's going to be very hard to get data from enterprise scale networks. Uh, for example, well, I can maybe do some front end on my lab and get something out for the channel, but it's hard for me to get backhaul data from, from some enterprise network. And this is just one example. There could be many others. What is it that industry can do 
to ease this accessibility. Is there, any, is there a real intent as well to do this in the first place? That's, that's number one. And, and if so, what could be done so that more and more students and researchers don't have to wait to join a company and then start to contribute, but can do so at a grassroots level and get trained on some of these complex problems that exist perhaps in these companies. So I'll stop here, but I'll really open the floor to, uh, to any inputs. Yeah, I, I, can, I can go first. I think it's a fantastic question. I mean, then I think that's really at the heart, I think what, what's hopefully going to happen and change over the next few years. So, um, um, because I mean, it's not only students. I, I, I see this massive, kind of separation between academic research and what's relevant to industry. And um, that's not only a problem of, you know, getting access to data, it's actually, you know, in academic research, you have, you, have, you have limited compute, but in many cases you want to do something mathematically. So we resort to simple models where you can prove something and show something, but that's a very long way from actually putting it into product. And so that's why it's not immediately relevant to industry. But there's really nobody who bridges this gap. And so I think what needs to happen is that the academic research you know, uses data set, realistic simulations, possible test beds to make the research more relevant. But someone needs to develop essentially these platforms that allow you to do actually these realistic simulations and building test beds without too much effort. And I think so this is where industry comes in. And I, um, and I, and I really hope that this is going to happen. That uh, I mean, there are increasingly, you know, with Open RAN, there are more and more opportunities actually for even universities to build 5G test beds, hopefully 6G test beds, to use it, try the algorithms on, on a real system and not just a, a toy model. So it makes the research more credible. This will also allow, um, you know, to, to create data sets that are relevant. I think you, you, you are at heading one of these initiatives. I think the, at MIT, there was this RF challenge, which I found quite uh, fascinating. So I hope that this is now really gaining momentum. But I think that's the change that's needed in our community to, to bridge this gap. But I think all the elements are there, you know, increased openness, um, sharing, repro reproducibility of research that, that, that all goes hand in hand. So. Um, and I think we don't need, you know, we don't need data of millions of private users for our research. You know, we speak about RF data, so or it's most likely privacy is not so much an issue for this type of research. And, and, and I want to, if I may, I want to say that the, these, this is already happening. You know, the community is coming together. Things, partnerships like the rings that 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 we're, some of us are part of. We're going to see more of that. Uh, the NSF power test beds, their 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 test beds th uh, uh, throughout the country, that is happening. I think what we can also do is is perhaps push the uh, test bed, the research to things that are not just already, you know, last G, but sort of in the product type uh, uh, development phase, right? So, so that, that we can actually work with the uh, community, the research community for things that are, are not already there, but will be there so that we can test things and, and prototype things. And But we're, we're, we're coming there. I mean, this is, you know, in the last 20, 30 years that I've been uh, in this community, I don't think we've been any closer to this than, than now. And I think this is going to continue. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Uh, well, well, when 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 guest speakers talk, I, I sort of mute myself, and then. Uh, but so thank you, Nada. I appreciate that. Maggie, do you want to conclude? Uh, no, I just want to echo Nada that, you know, some of the RINGS program and also our MLWINS program, it's just trying to do exactly that in partnership with NSF. And, you know, NIST is, of course, involved in some encouraging these data sets and so forth. Uh, it's going to be continuing to be challenging for industry to share data, but through these challenges, I mean, that's one method. And, you know, methodology of AI methodology itself, like uh, Jacob mentioned digital twins, I mentioned predated learning and so forth. So those are tools that you can apply to solve some of these problems as well. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we are, uh, as we about to close the panel, I, I would still like to charge the panel with one additional request. Okay. And that request is, um, so let's say, you know, we have a 10 year span from now. Okay. Uh, what would you like to see that 
the community has enabled and now is part of the 6G standard. Uh, it's sort of about say 10 years from now, 6G is sort of, you know, midway through, it's sort of perhaps picking up steam. So what would it, what is the one thing that you feel if it was there or you would like to see it there and you feel that would be a big game changer? Um, I, I, I've put you all in a spot like this. this is, these are all questions that I'm throwing uh, out of the left field, but uh, I'd love to get a response from each of you on what is it that you'd love to see in 10 years time? Okay, I, I mean, I, I, I can start again. Um, th there are two things. One actually is not related to machine learning at all. And uh, I think I mentioned that at, at one point in my introduction is how long it has taken MIMO to go from theory to practice. And I still think that 5G has not gotten it totally right. So we are still far away from um, high, you know, getting true reciprocity-based beam forming where you can scale a large number of users and that's not happening. Uh, we also see that at the millimeter wave, MIMO is not the killer. So I hope that we get these things right for 6G. Um, and now with respect to machine learning, I would really hope that there will be signaling and procedures in place that would at least allow for someone who wanted to deploy a learned um, waveform and use it. Because right now you can't do it. So I'm not saying that 6G should be based on you know, something that we have learned or it should only be based on this. But this is what it is what's possible. It supports kind of learning of, of a new physical layer on some parts of the spectrum if you want it. I think that would be a, a big achievement. Thank you. Um, who would like to go I'll just add, yeah. Uh, yes. So I guess since I'm a, this is my bias view, uh, being a researcher in the area of uh, distributed AI and so forth, I would like to, uh, you know, to see uh, dev end devices having capable of AI training and online training and so forth, where it will really make AI solutions much more pervasive than they seem to be and really move it out from the data center to all the way to edge devices. So that's a wish, personal wish list. All right, all right. I'll, I'll put it in the box of, 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 of the, the wish list box that I'm making here, uh, but, but that's great. Um, Nada, you want to go next? Uh, sure. Uh, I guess for me, it's going to be a very uh, sort of um, uh, down to earth uh, comment is that we won't ask where the data is coming from. It will be there. <laughs> and we will use it and we will be completely seamless and we won't be asking, you know, where's the data? Give me the data. I don't have the data, et cetera. That's a loaded ask, but but you know I, I completely you know it's a small ask that you said you compressed it in one sentence, but but there's a lot going on behind it. So uh, well yes okay that's certainly in the in the wish list box. Uh, Bill, uh, uh, I'm just impressed with Nada's uh, sheer optimism. That was impressive. <laughs> but I think, uh, if I look at um where I, I'd like to see all this go, um, you know it's interesting. There's the convergence of a uh, you know, cloud and fog, and I look at all these different things coming together, and uh, you know, the convergence of space and terrestrial internet, all these different things. What I'd like to see is um, what was mentioned earlier was just to find these kind of large scale sensory networks that we could create to basically enable things like load balancing climate change. If something happens in one part of the world, noticing what the impact is in specific ways in other parts of the world learning to basically contextualize that and make it more intelligent. And then, um, cause all the pieces exist, we just need to network them together. And I think 6G could be a, just another step in that, that direction to enable that techno technological leap that I think we just can't, we, we can't avoid it anymore. It's something we really need to look at. Fantastic, I think that's a very positive note, a very positive and a hope for the future as well. And. Uh... Uh, and so uh, let's conclude the panel here. I would want to say thank you to our distinguished panelists, Nagin, Nada, Bill, and Jacob for taking this time out of your very, very busy schedules. I have tried to get on your calendar sometimes at different times. I have been on the receiving end. So I really appreciate that you've been able to carve this time out for the audience. Um, also for the audience, uh, just to let you know that uh, by next week, we will have the recorded uh, sessions made available to you. You will get an email, so you'll be able to access all this great programming content uh, at, at your leisure through uh, by logging in into the 60 Symposium website. Um, so in that case, uh, panelists, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. 
uh, and uh, we'll be in touch on one-on-one. -on -one. We'll continue the discussion forward. Clearly, this is just the start. Thank you very much.